Boom, what's up, peeps? We're here. I just jumped in right here. We are here at Book Club, Gap Selling Book Club, part two, part two, section part two, and all that cool stuff. Chapters, I believe, seven through 13 or 14 or something like that. And I'm excited to have our celebrity guest. I like saying that like I'm on TV or some shit. Um, Mr. Josh Braun, JB himself in the house. What's up, JB? I love, I love being a celebrity guest. I, I love it. It's, I, like, I think you should call me that every day. It'd be fantastic. CB, the JB, the CB. Yeah, I like it. I like yeah. it. JBCB, I like that. JBCB really rolls off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got my boy Jeff Broderick down here. What's up, Jeff? Another hey, JB. What's going on? Yeah, the uncelebrity JB over here. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Doing great, man. Thanks for having Thanks for coming. I'm glad to have you. And then we got Mr. Levine, KL, Kevin Levine. How you doing, baby? Welcome. Doing, doing great. Thank you, Keenan. Appreciate it. Excited to be here. Good, good, good. For those of you who are watching, look, we're just going to break down Gap Selling. I mean, that's all. We're going to have fun talking about it. Um, uh, we'll take your your questions um, through LinkedIn. If you have any questions about the book, you want to share your experiences with the book. And this is meant to be a book club, um, not a book promotion, You know, not a, a preaching session, but just we're going to break it down. Likes, dislikes, confusions, questions, and just dissect, diagnose, and, and have fun with the whole thing. And so um, rather than me running the show, who wants to jump in and kick this off? I mean, I'll kick off with a story, if I may. I love stories, so go. Okay, so I have a landscaper. I've written about him several times on LinkedIn. Yes. His, name is, his name is Lewis, and this just happened last week. So I have some backyard madness happening. I have some mulch that needed to be replaced. So I called Lewis, and I said, hey, can you replace the mulch? It was like $350 last time. Kick off with a and, story. And he I said, uh, hey, yeah, what, what, uh, what's, what's wrong with your mulch? I mean, it's kind of thin, discolored. He goes, you also notice the grass is a little brown back there, a little bit in patches. I go, yeah, it is. He goes, go just replace the mulch and fix the sprinkler. He goes, we could do that. But what if we put it like a rock bed back there with like a nice path? I go, that sounds awesome. How much is that? He goes, 1200 I go, no way, dude. I'm not spending <laughs> 1200 bucks on that. It's $350 for the mulch. Let's just replace it. He goes, I can do it. He goes, but the mulch is going to have to be replaced a couple times a year. And to put some new sprinkler zones back there is another 500 So you're looking at like 1200 you know, your, your choice. And I put a rock bed back there with a path. I, I just posted a picture of it to LinkedIn. I think he's reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, tell me, tell me this part though. How much do you love him for doing that? That's the thing, right? It, that, to your to your point, I didn't feel like it was a salesy manipulative tactic. I actually felt like he was doing what was in my best interest, and I was kind of short sighted. I wasn't really thinking about it, right? It's like. Death by a thousand paper cuts. Like that's just three fifty. Because it's not really just three fifty. It's three fifty times three fifty times three. It's it's you sort of amortize it over the lifetime. He goes unless you're yep. leaving the house in yep. a couple of weeks. He goes. I go now. I'm going to be staying here for a while. He's like, you know. So I I did feel like he was doing it in my best interest. But it's such a subtle skill that I think it's not something that comes inherently natural for people. So so this is a good kickoff to it because then and then because we'll get into it, but. Okay, I'm going to go on a limb here because normally I'm the bad guy, but it's not as – I think it's a mindset, not a skill. And here's why. It's a mindset – listen to everybody. Just please listen. To fucking help, okay? It's just to fucking help somebody. It's to literally stop and say, how can I help these people out? How can I provide value that makes their life easier, right? But most people aren't in the realm of how do I help – they're in the realm of what am I supposed to do, right? And they subjugate themselves to the buyer. They subjugate themselves to their bosses, go sell this, or they just don't give a shit. Oh, I should have worn my give a shit t-shirt, right? They just don't give a shit. It's like, I'm here. Just tell me what you want. I'm going to do the job. I'll move on, collect my money. And if you get into a helping mindset, a giving mindset, a little, um, you know, uh, what's his name? I uh, give and take Adam Grant, like just get a giving mindset. And it's amazing how good a salesperson you can be. But, but why do you think that happens? I mean, these are not ill, you know, these are well-intentioned salespeople. They're trying to do their best. What do you think the cause of that is? I don't think they know they're supposed to help. For real. Like, I don't know that they, that I think they still think they're supposed to sell something. They don't see themselves as helpers. Like, I literally, you know, I wish I could call an example right off the top of my head, but I know it's happened where a, a salesperson or not even a salesperson, a business owner, like your landscaper guy, whatever, right? And they, and they say, okay, we're gonna do this. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, well, what if I did this? 
would that be easier? Would that save me money? Would that improve the value? Like, like solving the problem better? And they're like, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. That really would work. And then I'm like, why the fuck didn't you? Like, why am I doing your job here? Like, literally, why am I doing your job? I hired you to be my guy or my girl, and I'm literally thinking for you. But, you're, but let, let me push back on you a little bit. You say it's not a skill. And so I would imagine that that person is still trying to help you in their way. Like, maybe they're limited. Maybe they have a gap in, in skill on how to help you in a better way. I mean, maybe it's not intentional. You disagree? No, I don't think it's intentional because intentional means I'm thinking ahead, right? No, I literally mean like, okay, this is this is funny. Like everybody, everybody, I got a new term for myself. I'm gonna give Adam Grant credit, and one of the guys who just finished my online training, um, not my my Gap Selling certification. He's now a Gap Selling certified trainer. Great guy, Cliff. Um, he gave me this type, this this moniker, and I'm holding on to it. I'm a disagreeable giver. If you've ever read his give and take, I'm a disagreeable giver. And basically, I'm the guy that challenges you, pushes you, and makes you uncomfortable, et cetera. But it all comes out of love. Like, it's like, I want the best of you. So this is where this comes from. I I watch most people, when they're in a position and they recognize they're there to help, come up with great ideas. So if their friend came and said, oh, my boyfriend just broke up with me. Am I great? I'm really hurting. They have good ideas. They're like, okay, look, we got to help you out here. Let's get you out and have a drink. And let's do this. And And they got all the great ideas. So people know how to help when they recognize they're supposed to help. Can I jump in, Keenan? Because uh, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. actually, uh, sitting here listening to the two of you, it's 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 funny because I agree with both of you I, I, in the aspect of is it a skill or not a skill. And I think the difference between the two is empathy versus compassion. And I think to Ooh. be able to listen with empathy is not a skill. That is That is something that you just naturally can be ingrained with or you just need to shift your perspective on in, in understanding and listening from somebody else's perspective and understanding what it is the problem that they're going through. That's empathy. But compassion is now taking it to the next step and trying to figure out how can I help this person? What can we, what can I say? What can I do to help this person overcome what those challenges are? And they are two different skill sets. And in fact, I've had to learn this in my marriage that sometimes my wife doesn't want compassion. Sometimes my wife just wants empathy. She just wants a sounding board. She just wants to express what it is that's bothering her and, and have me validate that by understanding it and repeating it back to her, but not necessarily saying, but, but honey, listen, this is what we can do. Or, Hey, we can, she's not looking for the fix sometimes. And other times she is looking for the fix. And so there is a skill set in that and understand, in, in my opinion, in understanding the difference between, do I need to be empathetic or do I need to be compassionate in my skills that I'm expressing right now? Shouldn't we be both when we're selling though? Yes. I think you have to be. I think you have to be compassionate in sales. Um, but I think you have to be empathetic and truly empathetic in order to be compassionate. Yeah, there's this, there's this also this other skill that's kind of woven throughout the gap selling uh, book, which is this idea that people don't always know what they want. Like they'll ask for stuff. Like I, I'm asking for mulch. And I've had this happen many times in my career as a seller and as a, as a buyer, where I've asked for something, mm-hmm. but then I had the salesperson, or sometimes I've done this, say, well, what you really want is this. And mm-hmm. if you kind of go down this path, here's the sort of cost of, the, of that versus this. Um, that, that kind of thinking is a little bit different because oftentimes I think people will take what someone said and say, well, let, me, let me go give you that. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than kind of thinking through this other layer, which is a little bit more complex. I mean, some of the math you have in your book, Keenan, is simple math, but it's not something that I don't think salespeople, or my, myself included, um, are comfortable doing, especially if it's more complicated. You know, sort of kind of calculating the cost of inaction, calculating all that stuff. So what what is your recommendation for sort of, or first off, do you think that's a skill and how do you start to sharpen your acumen um, in that area? Um, I think I think it's a skill to get to it. So to recognize and not accept it, I think that's you know hard skill, soft skill. Like I can teach you hard skill. It's hard skill. I can teach you when someone says I need something, don't start selling. Like I, I can teach you that. That's a hard skill. Learning how to get it out of people and getting good at that. That's more on the soft skill side. Probably balances between the two more on the soft skill side. But it's funny because when you think about chapter seven, right, the very first chapter in part two, it says you have to get them to let you help get them to let you help right and i think that's the part salespeople aren't very good at whether it's how they start the sale or whether it's um 
how they view the sale, but they don't recognize that they need the buyer to give them information. They need the buyer to have a conversation with you in order for you to help them. I see Kevin shaking his head. What do you, what do you think, Kevin? Well, that was one of the things that I thought about when I was reading the book and as I read it over and over and study this material. And that is, you do need the trust, but how do you get it? And, you know, I think you talk, talked about that to some degree, but there may be a skill in that because, you know, they don't know you. And, you know, I would like to get their trust sooner than later. Uh, you may not have another chance. And, 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 and so when you try to compress that into a very small amount of time, you know, what's the, I, I'm very analytical. So the fact that you talked about, uh, you know, the skill versus, you know, the mindset of, of being compassionate and having empathy and all these kinds of things, I thought, wow, I just learned something, you know, because I, I study this like crazy and I'm just, I, I try to analyze and put everything in, into pieces and, and I'm like, wait, wait a minute. And, you know, what's interesting is that I come from a customer success background and, you know, that's what we should be doing anyway, is having empathy and compassion for our customers. So it was just like a big aha to me, uh, you know, that, that conversation. No, nope. well said, especially for an analytical, right? I mean, <laughs> I, if I, if I have to like reduce it all, if we can recognize that when somebody is looking, whether we outbound them, which Jocelyn is brilliant at helping people do, and we got them engaged or they inbounded, the fact that they're having that conversation with us implies that something isn't perfect. Right now, the range of that imperfection and the, and the impact of that imperfection and, and why that imperfection exists, that's all yet to be determined. But the fact that they've said, hey, I'll sit and talk to you for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever we've asked for in the beginning, implies there is some imperfection. And so for us to say, all right, I'm here to help. Like, I'm here to help you get better. Whatever that get better is, if you can start in that mind frame, be like, okay, talk to me. What's going on? Because this is something I do all the time that drives people crazy. And I never realized it until I got older. When friends come to me and they say, Keenan, or many of you here who've written me a a text or an email on LinkedIn and said, hey, Keenan, I have a question. I need your help. I bet you do this too, John, and you too made as well. But I always say, all right, great. I love it. Tell me more. Give me more. Can you explain? Walk me through this. Because I don't dare say a word until I feel I understand what the real problem is and what they're really trying to accomplish. But see, what you're good at, Keenan, too, and what's in the book, which I think is, you know, I, I we understand, I think, you know, we have to help people. We've heard a lot of that before. But like, how do I know the questions to ask so that I could start to quantify what this opportunity is? You know, a simple framework that I've learned a long time ago that you've expanded on in your book and it's much better and much more detailed is this this really simple thing that I just try to keep in my head. I can't always do it. And I want to talk about the obstacles I bump into when I do it for my business and get your take on it. But it's like, you know, where are you now? Where do you want to go? What's the value of the difference? What's the value of difference over time? And what obstacles has you, have you bumped into? Now, I, I kind of have that in my head, but sometimes the prospect doesn't have the data. Yep. So what do you do in those situations? Uh, I, would, I have some ideas, but I want to get the groups taking your take, Keenan, in, in those situations where they're just like, oh, I don't know, we don't, we don't track that, we don't have that, I don't know. You have to sign an NDA. All this kind of, all these, I have to give a blood sample. Uh, but I would do it for like, if I could get a COVID vaccine, I would, I don't know. Anyway, so how, how would you do that when, they, when they're just not coughing up the data? They don't have, not because they're holding it back, mm -hmm. because they just can't, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jeff or, or before I go, Jeff or Kevin, do you guys have any thoughts? You want me to jump in? Uh, I, I'm happy to express a little bit of thought on it just because I bump into that as well often. Um, and I, and I would love to hear uh, your take on it for sure. You know, the way that I, typically explore when I when I come in and and for me and what I do more times than not and in fact I would say almost 100% of the time the people that I am uh, working with do not have the data they don't have the data so I can't get to the bottom lines that I'm trying to get to but that in and of itself becomes the gap for what it is that I am presenting and um, and getting them to start with the business problem of of what it how much how much spend do you waste how much wasteful spend does the company incur every single year well we're not really sure okay well now i'm going to work backwards and figure out the technical problems that are causing them to not 
understand because that is a problem. Now, wasteful spend, spending waste is is a business problem for sure. They're, they're, they're wasting so much money. But not understanding that is in and of itself a business it's a problem. Cause. It's a root cause. It's a root co- I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. You're a root, a root cause. And so starting at that root cause then allows me to explore and demonstrate based upon values, what that could equate to and understanding what it is that that they don't yet know. That's where I typically go with it. I don't know, Keenan. You, you're the no, man. No, no, I like where you're going. Kevin, any thoughts? So, Keenan, are you saying it's the root cause because if you don't track it, you don't know what it is? Yep, and you exactly. Work on it? Yep, yep, yep. You got it. That's what I figured. Yep. And not tracking is a process. So that's a technical problem, right? So, so what would you do in that situation, Keenan? If you're bumping into that for a prospect, you're trying to get some data and they don't have it. Are you saying I need to get to that, <laughs> or no, are you actually, walking? Are you walking I, away from that? Are you walking no, away I, from that? No, I actually corner them. I bracket it. I bracket it. It's amazing how much people actually know, right? So, with a little bit of information, right, you can start bracketing things. So, in in just case, I know he does roofing, so I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I might say something like, uh, "What what would be a question you'd ask they wouldn't know when you say spend, right?" Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say um, how much uh, how much money do you inappropriately allocate each year towards repairing your roof instead of moving it to capital and replacing your roof? Yes. So that what I, so what I would say is, OK, over the last five years or three years, or whatever the number, two years, how many times have you had to call the roofer to come out? Right. And then I'm going to be really hard with this. And, and they might say, I don't know. And I say, OK, have you had to call the roofer at all? Right now, the fact that they would, wouldn't even know if they had to c- call it all, that's going to be rare. Like someone's going to know if I'm talking to the right person, they're going to know at least. Yeah, they might be like, yeah, I think I may have called them once. OK, how big is your roof? OK, they're going to I'm playing as hard a ball as you can get. They're going to say, I don't know how big the roof is. I'm like, OK, well, how big is the square foot of your location? Like, I don't know. Well, OK, I'm playing hardball here. Right. And then I'm saying, OK, let me ask it this way. Is it, it, would it hold 20 cars? Oh, no, it's much bigger than that. No, no, yeah, yeah. It would probably hold 75 to 100 cars. All right, so ballpark now, we're talking about, no, Jeff, I'd probably know if I were you, but we're talking about probably, you know, uh, 100 square hundred square yards or 300 square feet for your roof, about the size of a square football field. Yeah, I guess that's kind of close, right? So now I've got you close, and then I can say, okay, based on that, the average roofer, when they have to come out and mess with something like that, that's probably going to a cost – you know, Jeff, you know where I'm going, right? I'm not nailing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I got you. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And so what I end up doing, when you ask questions like that, eventually they stop trying to be accurate and they start trying to be in the ballpark. And this is where it's cool. When you're selling something, you're trying to fix a problem. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, $100 million or $80 million. It's still a problem. You see what I'm saying? So you, you get them to say, all right, yeah, all right, you get, you're right. It's, this is a problem. So that's what I do is I bracket it and I keep going until they give me the answer. Let me ask you another question. I'm curious because after reading this chapter, obviously it's very logical, very based on analytics and numbers and building a business case. Hey, you have a, a $400,000 problem. We're $100,000. You want to buy it. And if that worked all the time, sales would be so easy, um, but it doesn't. Oftentimes people see that and they're like, no, we don't, want, we don't want to do it. Or what sometimes I've heard in my career is awesome. Can you guarantee it? Because obviously if it works and we're going to give you a hundred grand, and you're going to save us 350 or we're going to make 500. What happens if we don't? <laughs> you know, so talk to me about those two cases, Keenan. <laughs> like right, how, do you, so, how do you sort yeah. of, what are so, your thoughts on So, yeah, I'll give you that. And then I'm not going to let you do what you always do, Josh. What am I you doing? Make, what am you I always doing? Make an interview. You're great at questions. Oh, I am? An interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, listen, the way I do that is, um, first off, I tell people all the time, it's not just about the money. So if you know they're losing $400,000, you have to ask themselves, okay, what's been the impact of that, right? So are you guys not making your, I mean, with 400,000, it would be a publicly traded company, but I digress, right? Um, are you not making your um, uh, quarterly numbers? Uh, I mean, your quarterly profit EBITDA numbers. Are you having a hard time investing in other places? Um, have you not been able to launch particular um, campaigns? Like, so it's not just the $400,000. You've got to dig in and find out what's been the impact of losing this money, number one. Number two is, no, I don't guarantee it. No, what I say is that's that's where the one, when you're done with that, that's where the solution piece comes in. And that's why the root causes are so important. When somebody starts asking you, when you start saying, oh, I can do this and I can do that. If you haven't dug out the root causes, 
then you're just throwing stuff at them. So in Jeff's case, I'm assuming his solution addresses the ability to track it. So when you start attacking the root causes and you don't start selling the future state, they start believing you can do it. Because it's like, all right, well, look, because you, you don't know, you don't know because you can't track. And you also don't, you don't track. So therefore, you don't understand the four most important things to tracking wasted expenditure against the roof is A, B, C, and D. And they're like, well, I didn't even know about C and D. So now they're like, oh, shit, this guy knows something I don't know. This is super impressive. And he brings his little software and whatever. Let me show you how this would work. And so you earn their credibility that you can deliver it by attacking the root causes, not pitching the end result. Mm. I ran into that with my mom uh, about eight <laughs> months ago, Keenan. Oddly enough, she called me up needing a new computer. Yep. And I, I looked at my gap selling book. I'm like, shit, talking to mom on gap selling. Let's see how I, she's good, man. She's so, and so I said, Hey, what, what leads you to believe you need a new computer? Right. Yeah. I have a chapter one, of, one of your chapters. And yep. she's like, well, I can't log into Facebook. But it turns That's out that every time my mom lost her password, she was creating new Facebook accounts and she thought it was her computer. So I had to get to the root cause of the problem. I had to fix the password problem to your point, buying the new computer would not, I still would have been uh, behind the eight ball. So that, that's a great point. <laughs> Keenan, yeah. let me ask you too, cause uh, you, you mentioned root cause and uh, you said something in, I, I think it was chapter eight, uh, might've been chapter nine, but you made a comment uh, in the book that the root cause is sometimes a technical problem, but not always a technical problem. Could you share with me how a root cause would not be a technical problem? Uh, are you sure you read that right? Or do I need uh, a vision? Because the technical problem, a root is cause- Is always a root cause? A root, yes, technical problem is always a root cause. All right, then I won't, I won't, I won't put your feet on the fire, but I'll, but but I'll send it to you. Find it, fine, if you find it. I will, it, I will, I will, yeah. Neither I screwed up or I'll, or I'll rewind it, or maybe I meant something different. That's, yeah, because I couldn't figure it out. And I did, I did, I, I did hear it, and uh, uh, I was audio booking. Not so. I'll I'll look I'll look in my text as well and see if I can find it. But uh, but yeah, I'll send it to you because because that did throw me for a little bit of a loop. I was trying to figure out how is a root cause not a tech. No, sometimes not a technical problem. Cause. Now it may not be a. It, I may have been say, may have been saying. Now you make me curious. I want to go through this whole thing. Yeah, now. I yeah. may have been saying that a technical problem you may find may not actually be a root cause to that problem. Okay. Okay. Right? Right, so they're telling you all of this stuff. And you're like, okay, those are all root causes to problem A, but this other thing has nothing to do with that. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. Not creating I, that problem. So you're talking about roofing, and someone also says something like, I don't know, um, our warehouse guys don't come in on time, and that's making things worse. Well, that's why it's not getting cleaned up. But it has nothing to do why the roof is. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's a, yes. it's a root cause to the additional expense, but it has nothing to do with why that roof is leaking or why you can't track it, blah, blah, blah. So maybe it's something like that. So a technical problem may not always be the root cause, but a root cause is always a technical problem. Yeah, and I agree that, with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, maybe, and maybe that was the, I'll, I'll look back on it. So yeah, I appreciate you clarifying so, that. So, so something else, Keenan, I wanted to talk a little bit about too is does context matter with regards to the approach? Well, what I mean by that is uh, several months ago, I called uh, Canyon, they're a bike manufacturing company. They sell bikes online. And I was looking into bikes and the, the rep said a asked a question that was great. He said, um, what research have you done on, on us and in this bike on this bike? Yep. And the thought occurred to me, he wants to see how far down the journey I am. Mm -hmm. So if I'm telling him about the seven bikes I looked at and this is the one I just have, a, he's gonna, it's a very different conversation than if I'm just sort of starting, right? Yep. So my question is, if someone's really late, like I'm coming, I've been looking at bikes for six months I've had my eye on this thing. I know about the I know about the Dura Ace gears. I know what, how, how much everything weighs. I know about the power meter. I know everything. I just want the price shipped okay. to my door with with this extra option. Mm -hmm. I don't want an analysis in this case. Okay. Um, versus someone that's at the beginning. Are there instances where we skip some of the process in no. gap? No. Nope. And I'm going to give you a story why. And and this story comes from Brady because she was here. So there was this gentleman, Brady was, at a, and it's about a bike. So it works perfectly. Brady, you're going to love this. And Brady, if I get it wrong, okay, but the point will be missed. So Brady told me a story that she was at a bike shop and I don't know what she was looking for. And she heard a man talking to a woman about bikes, right? And he kept hearing the man ask questions that seemed targeted around two things. He kept asking them over and over, not the same question, but very similar questions. And she said they fell in two buckets. They fell in the bucket of, um, comfortability and durability, okay? And this lady kept explaining how comfortable the bike was and why it would be comfortable and 
and answered his question around durability and kept. And finally, Brady, you know, working for us and getting fed up, walked over to the man and said, look, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I guess the lady walked away for a second or something. He said, I'm really sorry to, to interrupt. I know it's none of my business, but can you tell me why are you buying this bike? Why is comfortability and what's, what's so important to you? And this is what he said. He said, my life's goal or dream has been to ride uh oh, the Pacific Trail, not the Pacific Coast Highway, the Pacific Trail. Now, if you know anything about the Pacific Trail, it is about 2,200 miles from the mountains of Alaska, not Alaska, of uh, Canada, all the way down to Mexico. So at some point, you're as low as the, the Valley of Death or whatever that's, whatever that, um, right? The Death Valley thing, and you're as high as I think is 12,000 feet in the mountains, and it's cold. And as you go along, there can be 40, 50, 60 mile stretches where you're not near anything, right? So she basically looked at the bike he was looking at, and it was a thousand dollar bike. And she said, you can't buy that bike. Brady knows a lot about bikes. She goes, it will not make it. Number one, you will not be comfortable enough, right? Remember, comfortable is subjective, and it is not durable enough. And she walked through some reasons why. It had something to do with the one example was the derailleur. And she said, if this derailleur goes and you're 45 miles out, you're going to be walking that bike for 45 miles, right? And so she said, this is the type of bike you need. It's a $7,000 bike. He ended up buying the $7,000 bike, and here's why. He told her that it was a lifelong dream. His kids had got, just gone off to college, and now he could go. His wife, had, like I don't say approved, but his wife had given him permission to be gone for the three months, right? He had been saving his whole life. This was his thing. And so to fuck it up over a few thousand dollars because he didn't know what it required. And when you asked your question, that's the key piece. I don't care how much research you're doing. You may not know what you don't know. And if you don't understand the Pacific Trail or you don't really understand what durable from a biking perspective is, I don't care how much research you've done. You, you lose nothing by taking the five or 10 minutes to tell the salesperson what you're trying to accomplish. And a good salesperson will be like, oh, yeah, no, this will work for, perfect for you. A shitty one will be like, oh, no, it'll work for you because they want the sale and then you'll buy a shitty thing. So, no, you, no, you always do the gap sign. Hmm. Yeah. And the other thing is that if there was an objection or they decided not to buy it, you have nothing to, to go on from there because you know nothing about their situation. That too, Josh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something yeah. else. Um, another note I had in the book, the book is also very, I, I read the book and, I, and, and Kevin probably likes this, right? Cause he's a very analytical person, They're very analytical and we got to make the business case. This is going to be an interesting conversation to have. Is the decision made on a business case or is it more emotional and then justified with the business case? Kevin? Do we lead with the data or do we lead with the heart and justify with the data? Does it not matter? Kevin? Well, I, I like the question a lot. I'm very eager to hear the conversation around this one. Okay. Uh, but I believe that you have to have both. Now, whether I, re, I'm not really sure which one leads, to be honest, but, uh, but I really believe that you have to have both. You have to have a business. I've always heard it's the, it's the business decision first and then the, the emotional part second to, or I'm sorry, flip that around. <laughs> um, it's the emotional part first and then the business case to, to back it up. Um, but so I, I'll give you, I just, just, and again, I'm always blinded by only things that I've experienced and I know, which is why I love talking to Keenan and Jeff and you too now, Kevin, that I met you guys. So I only have experience based on what I've sold. So this might be, maybe it's contextual too, depending on what you're selling. Maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know, but here's, here's my background on it, Keenan. So I used to sell for a company called Jelly Vision, um, out of Chicago. And the problem right. that we solved was every year during open enrollment, People would get their medical benefits information. They'd get these big packets. They'd try to select what benefits they wanted and they couldn't understand anything. It was complicated. They didn't know what to choose. HR was getting hammered with calls. People would select the, the wrong benefits. It would cost the company a ton of money and them. It, would just, it was awful. It was complicated. So we made that problem go away. We created a experience that sounded like a person, actually had a personality, was funny, explained things in easy ways so that people could make better benefits choices. And it was predicated on this fact that we had game designers and humorists, comedians writing the stuff. Love it. The founder of the company created this game called You Don't Know Jack. Very successful trivia game back in the it. 90s. 
and we bring him out and we go, here's Harry. He, he created You Don't Know Jack. And some people would be like, hey, I played that game. And then I'd have Harry get on the call and put in his voice. He was the narrator of the original game. And he would start narrating HR questions. And these people were in love. And to me, I'm like, it's pretty much done, the sale. It's done. Yeah. Now, yeah. of course, we had to have some ROI language in the slides. But when I interviewed customers afterwards, and I did this time and time again with Jellyvision, I said, you know, what was the thing that sort of tipped the scale over? It was never anything to do with numbers ever, 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 ever. It was, I, I wanted to be cool. You guys were cool. And I wanted to have that, that credibility, that street cred of like being associated with it. And you guys made me smile. You kind of get us. We wanted to have more fun inside. Like it was always that kind of stuff. And maybe that's because of who I was selling to, or maybe it not. But companies, right? You sold what? to companies, right? I, so I sold to like Disney. I sold yeah. to McDonald's. I sold yeah. to Fortune Fives. Yeah. But yeah. I was selling to HR people. Yep. I wasn't selling to, I, I very rarely, I spoke to CFOs a couple times, mm -hmm. but mostly it was uh, HR directors, HR benefits people. Dude, so so you, I th I think you you weren't calculating the return. And this goes back to your question earlier. So the first thing I'll say is the frame is people buy not because of money or the heart or the emotion. In my opinion, they both play a role. But in my opinion, they buy based on the tension between where they are today and where they're going to be tomorrow. And that is both physical, that is both emotional and analytical. It's the tension between the two. That's why I'm such a pain in the ass when people try to learn gap selling if they don't commit to the current state first. Because the currency creates the tension. And even as you described it, you said, they just, watch what I do here. They wanted to be cool. So what does that tell you? In the gap selling model, what does that tell you? They weren't before. Boom! <laughs> Boom! Right then and there. They didn't think they were before. Now, when you add the fact that you're selling to HR, you add the fact that you're selling medical benefits, and you add to the fact that most companies already know that HR, medical benefits, and all that shit sucks, and nobody likes it, and it's a miserable experience, and, that's a and that Im impacts their culture, you basically went to a place where the culture of HR is shitty, it's compliant, it's boring, it's frustrating, people put it off to the last second, there's no value, and that's their whole current state. And you gave them a future state that not only provided the ROI dollar-wise, I'm sure it also got people to get um, to, um, to uh, how do you say, um, uh, uh, apply Partici to it earlier. Participate. Par participate. Yeah, participate earlier, so now they're not running around getting people um, – uh, at the last minute, so they're not uninundated the last few weeks. They're not dealing with people who missed the deadline, and now they're trying to get them into the program. So you have all of that, and it's fun. Dude, that's a no-brainer to me. It, it's the tension between where they were before and where they see themselves now, and that's why I call it the gap. Mm. Perfect. Yep. But see, so this I is the thing with that with that sale, which is interesting. So that's that that product usually ended up saving companies millions of dollars in tax liability because more people were participating yep. in health directed plans. Even though I had that data in those case studies, I never ever talked about, I always loved with Harry Gottlieb, the founder. I always loved with the, you don't know Jack story. I always loved with the game stuff. Yep. I always set it up with the, the Ferris Bueller teacher. Like this is the problem. I had a t picture of the Ferris Bueller teacher, the anyone, anyone scene yep. from that movie when the kids are drooling on their desk and I'd superimpose their employees. I yep. take actual employees from LinkedIn and superimpose their, their faces like in the slides. So their employees were kind of drooling and, and you can feel like you felt the connection happening. Well, what were you doing right there? What were you doing right there? I was, I was showing contrast. Yeah. But what, what, what part of the contrast when you, when you use the Bueller piece, the, the before the current, the current, the current right, the before, right. Yes. Like, so one of the things people miss is, in, if, if you could give me a savings and then give me like dollar saving and then give me something on top of it, it's always a no brainer. You would have had, if, if you were just going in without all of the humor and everything, which was the product, but let's just say you weren't, it was strictly a, a numbers, you know, ching, ching, ching thing. You would have found yourself having to defend that ROI more often. That's right. Yes, because it was just the it was just the dollars. Now you could have found internal things that could have helped with that. Because what you would have done is you would have said, "How much happy do you think your employees will be?" Like you could have done that, and so you would have got to the emotional state anyways. But you your your company made it easy to do that. So mm. it's never just the money ever, 
Ever. Tina, can I, can I jump in on something yeah, here? Because I want I want to understand um, maybe a better way that I can approach some things too on the same topic. And by the way, I love the uh, Ferris Bueller reference with my last name and being from Chicago my whole life. <laughs> it's it just was perfect. So, oh yeah, Broderick. It. I just noticed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, so oftentimes the person that I am selling to will also need to go up the chain to somebody in other departments, other divisions, and be able to get the buy-in from them to be able to implement what it is that I'm selling. And um, and and this isn't a, a situation where I'm pitching the wrong, wrong person or I'm talking to the wrong person or I need to go up the chain and talk to them. The people that, that I need that need to make the decisions up the chain wouldn't care about 90% of what it is that this other person that I am selling cares about. That's the emotional side more than anything, but the analytics are super crucial because he needs to be able to go analytically to these other people in procurement departments or CFOs sometimes, depending on who, on who it is up the chain that has to make the final money decisions and be able to present that case. So would you recommend uh, me laying out, not once I get the buy-in from them, okay? So he's, he's, there, he's all about it, he understands it, now he needs to go make the case. Do I lay out an analytical case for him to go make to this person up the chain in order to get that buy-in or, or what are your thoughts? Let me give you my, yeah. give you my yeah. take on this. Let me give you my take. I want to turn over to Keenan next. So let me, let me make, let me, let me give you an idea, Jeff, and see if this works for your business. Cause I've okay. run into this before. Yeah. So in this approach, what I normally will do is I'll use some Chris Voss technique in the beginning from, for those of you that are not familiar, he's a uh, former FBI negotiator turned, calls himself a negotiator, but I think he's really about help, helping people feel heard. Yep. So I might say something like, um, sounds like you're really passionate about getting this approved. Sounds like you're really passionate about getting buy-in. Sounds like you really want to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And they usually will talk a little bit and make them feel heard. And then I'll say this, um, how long have you been working with this person? Oh, about seven, eight years. What might they say no to? Would it be price? Would it be something about the, sometimes that Keenan just taught me a new word bracketing. I, I don't, I never thought of that word before, but I give them, I usually call it multiple choice. Is it like, would they be a, you know, about price, something about the product? And we kind of, well, it'd be price. Well, it'd be like paying it all up front. They'd want to amortize it. It's just too much money. Like, and then I would say, how would you recommend we get around that? How would you, how would you address that if they asked you that? Because you're assuming that they want the analytical thing. And maybe that is the case, but I wouldn't make the assumption. I would enlist the help of your champion to see what they think the objection or the no might be, and then to see if they have ideas that maybe you can guide them and help them with. I don't know, Keenan, what you I think of it. that approach. No, I, I, I love the approach. Um, what, I, what I like to do, well, I kind of, I love the approach. I sort of take a, of a more of a um, what's their worldview approach. So, um, I would be like, okay, who is this person? Is it head of operations? Is the CEO? Is the CFO? Is whoever? And then I'm gonna think, okay, what's gonna bug them? What's their story, right? So I'm starting to think, okay, um, I might ask the question, okay, would the fact that they're spending X amount on repairing the roof regularly, do they know this? Number question number one, do they even know this is happening? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I don't know. I say, well, if they know, would it bother them or not bother them, right? Is that something that would get on the? I think I'd use the word. Is that something that would get on their radar, right? So I, I really want to understand what's important to them. And if I've done gap selling right, unless you're talking a, a, a Fortune 500 company where there literally can be millions of dollars lost that no one cares about, which you, you, know, you go too many layers up. I can tell a story with one client that, that I was working with that their buyer was losing $300 million a year. And they couldn't understand why they wouldn't move. And um, I finally got to the point where well, it's a $45 billion company. I mean, yeah, 325 is a lot, but – in the grand scheme of things, it's it's not. And so we got to find more, that gap's not that big. So in this case, I'm just going to find out what's, what's going to bug the next person. And it's the gap that I found. Remember, Jeff, is the gap that I found mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. enough to get their attention, to get on their radar. So when you put it in front of them, that person's like, wait, what? We're currently spending this and wait, what? We've had this much inventory loss because of leaks and wait, what? We spent this much in reclamation projects because it's leaked and, and wait, what? If we only spend this, that all that stuff will stop and blah, blah, blah. And, and here's the best part. I mean, this, this is a gift. But in one of those scenarios, I could picture someone saying, look, a reclamation um, expense is that high. But one time we had a leak and 
it cost us this one product we did a bunch of inventory on. And we actually, our biggest client happened to call that day wanting that product. <laughs> you, see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Right? And so then she's yeah. like, wait, and you mean to tell me that the reason we couldn't get on Johnson Jones account was because that leak caused that, that's what caused that problem? Okay, I'm in. So really you just have to build the, the make sure the gap actually is something that will affect the person going up. And, I'd and, ask also, and also and also, arming that person with the material. Like we used to create these little yeah. CFO packets at Jellyvision. Um, we'd have like this, this document and even a video where we'd walk the person through it hmm. because we couldn't rely sometimes on the HR professionals to do that. And we had a CFO that we worked with internally. Yeah. And so this other idea of like, can you create a, a tool that you can actually work with your champion on, but that he could send on your behalf? Uh, hey, hey, Mike. Uh, my name's Jeff. Been working with with Matt, and uh, this is kind of where where it's at. Let's walk you through some things. You, you do a screen share. To Keenan's point, you show the the before and after, or the current state versus the after state. And awesome. the way I look at it is like you're the arbiter of un, like this is the greatest thing about Gap. And this isn't a plug for the book. It's supposed to not to be. But to me, the greatest thing about Gap, for me and my soul, and my religion is you're the arbiter of unbiased information. Whether yes. you use Keenan or not to solve the problem really is up to you ultimately and, but but what keenan's do or what the book does and what you do is you're like i'm the arbiter of un unbiased information i'm shining a light on some things some of which you knew and some of which you don't know so that you can make a, a choice and yes oh by the way and oh by the way in the perfect world what i'm going to do is i'm going to also show you what your options are yes. and what those cost yeah i'm not gonna like because i know you're going to do it anyway so here's here's what this cost here's what this cost here's these other three three real estate agents here's their closing rates here's mine so that you can make a more informed decision. Like that to me is the magic of it because you're not really, you're biased if you're saying you're the, like Keenan can't tell me he's the best. He's biased. He wants, yep. I, nor can I. Yep. So you, you kind of take the commission breath out of it and you just present the facts and you detach from it yep. and say, it's up to you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. J Josh, I want to follow up on what you were saying in that uh, for me uh, as a customer success professional, I love the gap selling technique because it falls right in alignment with what we do. So this, the person who sells the offering actually makes the promises. And then as customer success, we deliver on those promises. So it's right in perfect alignment with what we do. So that's why I love this. And it also gives me as a technical analytical person, a way to actually create a sale as I have to, I also have responsibilities to expand and and uh you know sell into an organization so i think it's an awesome uh you know technique now i wanted to drill just a little bit deeper in the pick because you know this part uh, of the book talks about the pick and i working at corporations have seen where the goals of the of the organization are determined at the top and then they're they're filtered down as they're filtered down the organization when you get down to the bottom um everybody's got their tasks to do to make those goals, you know, happen. And I'm curious from a pick list perspective, uh, if I was a VP of sales and I was a, uh, a sales manager, how would my pick differ? Wouldn't because I probably have the same. Yeah. That's what I picks for the whole company. Pick is for the whole company. Now, if you got a really, really, really big company, like, you know, Honda and they make, you know, cars and lawn mowers. Okay. You can't have one, right? Because, there's so many different products, but at the product level, for the most part, it's it's a pick at the product level, and in some cases, it's the division level because all the products do the same thing; they're just different variations, right? So no, no, no. It, the pick is designed to to act as a compass or a guide, and to help the salesperson know what to go look at. Why send the salespeople out guessing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, if you know what problems you solve and you know the impact those problems have on an organization if they exist, and you know what causes and the root causes, teach your salespeople that, and that's all they have to go look for. It's like a doctor. When doctors go to medicine, or medical school, they say, hey, here's the disease, right? And this is the impact it has on people, and these are the root causes or the symptoms, right? So the doctor starts saying, hey, thanks for coming in. And he, he or she knows what to look for. They're not oh, just guessing. This, this, is the, this is the sort of, I think, magic approach of GAP. And I'll just tell another you know, brief story. I um, A good friend of mine is Jason Freed. He's the founder and CEO of Basecamp out of Chicago. Oh, yeah. And a year or so ago, he was working on this new email program that's now out called Hey. 
And he was telling me about it. I'm like, what's that going to cost? He's like 99 bucks a year. I go, I would never pay for email. Like I'm using Gmail. It's free. Yeah. Like, why would I ever do that? And he said one sentence to me, which is email's not free. And of course I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're paying with your privacy. Mm-hmm. Turns out that when you use Gmail, they scan through your email, they read your stuff and they sell it to advertisers. And if that's worth more to you than 99 bucks, we, get, we might have something for you, right? So the, the nice thing about the, the Gap approach is that it's sort of doing that, right? It's like, let me shine a light on things you might not know about. Let me yep. bring them to your attention. When you're the person bringing that to the attention that I didn't know, that creates such a strong emotional connection yep. with you and that other person. It, it, to me, it's a, it's a huge differentiator. What it is it that you, that's the thing that's like kind of theme in that book that I use from a prospecting perspective all the time, which is what can I illuminate, shine a light on that this person might not know about, regardless of whether or not they decide to do anything about it, that's out of my control. Regardless of if they choose me, that's out of my control, but at least I can bring it forth. And I have found that when you do that, it forges a strong connection. Like I want that person. <laughs> it's credibility. It's you, you've earned credibility. Um, I want to give you one thing to think about, Kevin, when you talked about um, customer service and, and, you know, here at Air to Sales Guy, which is we're going on a big branding rechain soon. We're not going to be a sales guy much longer, but I digress. Um, uh, What are you going to be called? I'm sorry? Can you say what you're going to be called yet? Uh, I've said it a couple of times. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I'll say it. it We're going to change it to a sales growth company. Ooh. Keep an ASG. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's going to be a sales growth company because um, the guy is starting to piss people off and no one knows. I didn't call it a guy when I had female employees. It was just the name of my blog when I started the company. And I remember you know, that. Yeah. And too many people get their panties in a wad for no particular reason without asking questions and understanding why we call it that. So anyway, sales growth company. Um, but you, you really want to know if you've sold well and a sales organization is truly gapified is when the sales team actually finds the gap, understands the current state knows the desired future state, knows the desired outcomes, has defined those desired outcomes, has defined the current state problems, et cetera, and completely calculated the gap. And they sell it and they give it to customer success. Now watch this. Then a year down the road, when renewal comes up, customer success isn't saying, hey, are you gonna renew? It's coming up, we got a deal. They say, hey, when you bought us last year, you Mm -hmm. said, this was happening, this was happening, this is happening, you were experiencing all this shit show stuff. You've been with us for a year and it appears you've reduced this or you've made this happen or can I ask you how these things are looking today? And you've lit- that's a true gap selling organization because you found it, you sold on it and now the customer success team has been managing to that for a whole year, everybody knows where you are. Yep. Ask me how many times that happens in a real organization though. You're, you're absolutely right. And the other thing you do is you make sure along the way that their goals haven't changed or yes. that you can find more value to deliver as well, because Absolutely. we don't want to wait till the end. In fact, it'll become a, a, an automatic renewal you, because you've done what you needed to do to prove your value. Amen. Amen. Um, all right. So here we are. We, we're, we're coming up on an end here. We started a little late, but let's really quickly um, what do you guys think about the demo chapter? So we got the demo chapter. Mm. What do you guys think about the demo yeah. chapter? Do a kick well, ass look demo. like 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 yeah, like you pointed out. I think the uh, the biggest problem that I certainly see, and I'm I'm sure I'm not alone in saying this, is people vomiting everything at people oh. that they have because <laughs> we have the endowment effect. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that bias. Uh, real famous research study. Real quick gave someone an origami bird and asked people, how would you put a price to this origami bird? And they all were like between five and six bucks. Group B, they gave them instructions to make the exact same origami bird. Ooh. They, had to, they had to make it, right? And what do you value it at? 15, 20 bucks. Yes. Right, same thing when we demo our products, we got this endowment effect. So we can't wait to tell people about our origami bird and all the different bells and whistles that it has. But in fact, on the buyer side, it's like, I don't need all those things. I just need, am I overpaying for this? Like what? Mm-hmm. Do I need all these little intricate folds and this mm-hmm. little beak that kind of goes down and like all this stuff. So I think I love the, the sort of theme of this chapter, which is um, it only matters if it matters to your prospect. And, mm-hmm. and my grandma is a great illustration of this in two minutes or less. I, I, she had the worst toaster in the world. <laughs> I'd go to her house 
almost every weekend, one slice of toast, light, and it took forever. I would come over with these new toasters, two slices, new toaster user interface, digital display, clearly way better. And she always told me to bring it back and to eat my soup. And, and the reason for that is that she was not in a rush. She only liked one piece of toast and she liked light toast. So just because my toaster was better to me, doesn't necessarily mean that it was better for my grandma. And to me, that kind of is the theme and thesis as I was reading the demo chapter again in preparation, like that's kind of the theme of that chapter. Yes. To me at least. Yes. No. And, and just, just to reinforce it, because seriously, like I probably suffer from what you called that thing before. What'd you call it? <laughs> What'd you call it? That syndrome? What was it? <laughs> The premature pitulation syndrome? No, no. The one you just said a second ago, where we know too much, but you started the origami story. Oh, Chris, and now, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, endowment effect. Endowment effect. So I'm gonna, I probably struggle with endowment effect when it comes to gap selling. But for that reason, I have to say this. Even in your situation where you talked about all the new toasters coming in, and it has this, and it does this, and da-da-da, right? And then you said, but she has all the time in the world. She likes light toast, and it was something else. One piece. One, yeah, one piece. Folks, list this. Even in this story, which is great to talk about the demo piece, but even in this piece, which I just know 90% of people don't understand about gap selling, even though they think they do, is really what your story was really truly about, um, Josh, was what? Before? She didn't have a problem. Right, there was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't say this enough to gap sellers. Even when we start to dissect this, we have all this pretty stuff that sounds great. It always comes back to, is there a problem? Well, I felt, and, I felt right, I was looking for a problem that didn't exist. And, 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 to even, and to even stress that even further, I would even argue, I think I've told this story before too, like I have problems all the time. Like right now I have a pixel out on the TV in my back bedroom, but I rarely watch it and I barely notice the pixel. So given all the other stuff I got to do with Lewis hitting me up every day for more money in the backyard, I'm not going to. So to your point in the book, if the gap is small, like I heard, I heard, I talked to someone last week. He's like, dude, I don't know why the doctor didn't do it. I'm going to save him 500 bucks a month. I go 500 bucks a month. That's probably her bar bill at the club. And it's not worth the risk of jeopardizing their business. They don't know you. So it's not like the problem alone isn't enough either. Even if you find one to your point. Well, and Keenan, uh, regarding the demo, you know, this is, I think, really important for salespeople in general, in my opinion, um, because, you know, I've been doing sales for 32 years. And in the 32 years that I've been doing this, demo was always the big thing that organizations push, sales managers pushed, do a good demo, let's sit down and let's role play and let's let's go through the scenario of you pitching their product and and demo, demo, demo. And, and I was caught up in that for years, years. Um, and always feeling like I'm casting this big wide net into a, a pond that I have no idea what, if there's fish in there, if what's in there, I have no idea what I'm about to pull out, but I'm just pulling out all this crap. Right. And, and learning that, that that's not the way to do this because you're spending so much time chasing your own tail on a bunch of stuff. That's never going to manifest itself into anything because all you're doing is just puking out your demo over everybody and everything in hopes that, somebody somewhere is going to grab it and go, yeah, I need that. Where if you would fish with a lure, number one, understand who, who is the fish that you're targeting? Yes. Where, where is that? Where is that lake at that has those fish? And yep. what is the lure that they need to see in order for them to understand that you are the right solution for them? And yep. that is the difference between what I believe most salespeople out there, unfortunately are doing and trying to figure out how to use uh, NLP and all kinds of crazy manipulative tactics to try to get somebody coerced into buying their product versus what gap selling teaches, which is how to understand what the right lure is and how to effectively bring it before the right people. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question on that. So is there a difference between an inbound versus an outbound demo then, Jeff? Like, so outbound, you're calling up people they're probably not problem aware. They don't know what's possible. Like I equate it to the Steve Jobs moment when he was on stage with the iPhone. I had a Blackberry. It was awesome until Steve Jobs stood up there and told me it was a problem. Smartphones aren't that smart. Yep. It's these keys that don't move. I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Yep. Versus inbound demo where maybe I'm a little further along. Right? But I, I see a mistake people making is they're doing these demos to people and they're asking all these discovery questions. Like, dude, you called me. Like, yeah. do you have to have a perspective like Steve Jobs at the beginning of the funnel yeah. when someone's coming in outbound? Well, you're calling them. Do you have to have a point of view and shine a light on some stuff that they might not have known about? Yes. 
like P90X, yes. right? great example, Tony Horton. The problem with traditional workouts is they have you do the same thing so your muscles plateau. Yeah. In order to grow your muscles, you got to confuse them. It's called muscle confusion. And if you buy into that, by the way, we got this thing called P90X, right? So the question for you guys in the group, Keenan and Jeff and, and Kevin is, do you change the story based on outbound versus someone that has been in the hunt for like six months? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no, no. What you change is your process for validating the problem exists. Mm. That's all that changes because again, at the end of the day, it's what the, the, the reasons they're going to buy are going to be a handful of business problems that exist. Now the, the subsequent impacts of those business problems currently today and what the desired outcomes are going to be different for each individual person. But if you come into me and you're like, look, I want to, I want to, you know, I want a P90X. I'm looking at P90X, right? So I'm like, well, talk to me about your workout routine, right? Have but they're not looking, but they're not looking for P90X. Okay. Then why they call in? What are they looking so, for? So, they, so this is outbound. Let's talk about outbound. So okay, P90X. Too, so I was going to hit both sides. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so the inbound is, I'm assuming they're coming yeah, yeah, in. Yeah. 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 The yeah, inbound yeah. is, I'm looking, so my question is, okay, great. I'm looking to validate where you are. So I want to know what type of weightlifter are you? Are you a guy who's trying to get yoked and compete, and therefore you're not? He was just waiting life? to do that. He was waiting a whole session to put to show his guns. He just he's like, Josh, please. He, like you, he texted man. me before. Te Keenan texted me. He goes, please bring up P90X so I can show my guns. He texted me this. <laughs> that's good. That's right. good. That's good. Right? Or or are you a a, a, a a recent mother who's just trying to shed a little bit of weight, and you've been doing it for three months and it's not working? Or like, what what where are you today, and what's going on if you're a P90X person? And then I'm going to go into your piece about confusing the muscle, right? If I outbound you, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to outbound you with with questions like, hey, you know, talk to me. Are you someone who works out not seeing the results you want? Are you someone who's plateaued? Are you someone who's trying to train and get to the next level? And I'm trying to get you to connect with me on one of those first, right? Whether it's a cold call or whether it's email. And the minute I get you to say yes to one of those problems, now you're on the same par with the inbound person. Then I walk through all of that. Then I share my proposal, or my, sorry, my um, product. Now, do you know who does that brilliantly? I said this to you, you know what I'm gonna say, Josh. The outbound examples you wanna use is an infomercial. Hmm. They start with the problem and get you to buy into the problem, not buy into the product. So no, I believe they're exactly the same. It's just how you validate the problem it can take a little longer with the outbound. And, and Josh, I want to say this too, and then I uh, would love to hear what Kevin has to say on it as well. But uh, I'm I'm a fan of you, by the way, Josh. Uh, I've, I've seen your stuff. I've learned a lot about Zelda and, and why uh, he <laughs> has to change up swords and all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, absolutely, really, really do love it. Um, but one of the biggest things um, that you really hit on hard is, is business development. You speak really well to BDRs. Um, I have a really unique perspective on all of that. And, and unlike Keenan, I'm not a fan of the two separate models. I like the all encompassing model. Um, and, uh, but the, the whole idea behind inbound versus outbound, in my opinion, is something that you hit on, which is first impression being so important. And when that inbound comes in, if you go with them, they're set, they are setting the tone for the first impression. And I don't want, that to be the case. What I like to do anytime somebody, I get something sent across my desk that says, hey, this person's reaching out, this is what they need, give them a call, is I, I ignore what they need. Uh, I, I'm not calling them back to say, hey, you need this? Well, let me tell you how we can help you with that. I'm going to reset it and put it right back to square one as I would if I was walking in and they had, I had no idea what they said that they needed or anything else so that I can walk them through the process of understanding their current state, what's going on in their world, what it is that maybe they don't recognize they really need for your example of your landscaping, you had no idea, and, and then get it to that stage. If I stick with what they are calling me about, I'm stuck in their first impression of what it is that I can do for them. And I don't want to be that. I want to be resetting. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great point. It's it's kind of like the, the pill, right, for the headache or yes. the bicycle that costs $7,000 versus, a, uh, you know, three or four hundred dollars or whatever you, amount you talked about it's what is the impact and what what are you trying to do and and, and you don't know and they don't know either see, see the thing that I see though too is and this is where I'm kind of getting at Keenan and Jeff and Kevin is for outbound and maybe for inbound too you have to have a per like one of the things about Keenan is he has a point of view 
Yes. You might not like it. It's a point. Jason Freed at Basecamp has a point of view. Yep. Steve Jobs has a point of view. Oftentimes, I see that salespeople don't have a point of view, mm. right? So, and sometimes they do. But I, I think one of the things that sells people is a point of view. Mm-hmm. You know, so on these demo calls, before we're even getting there, like, what's your, what's, what, where do we see what's broken now in the current state of things, regardless of what's going on with us or you or anything like, what's going on with this working out stuff? Like people used to think that I'd do 10 sets with 50 pounds each. And that's just how they stayed healthy. Something mm-hmm. changed. The iPhone, the, the, the BlackBerry is not smart anymore. It's these keys. They don't move. They're just mm-hmm. fixed. Well, every application wants a different set of keys. Email's not free. It, it's, it's invasion of your privacy. Like all these perspectives I to, me create, a, to me create a bond. That's how Keenan got on my radar. I'm like, this guy's got a point of view. Like I'm drawn to that. I think when you, when you have an enemy, <laughs> on these discovery calls, I, I call it, for lack of a better word, there's an enemy. Jason Fried's enemy is Yahoo. It's Gmail. Mm-hmm. It's the cluttered inbox. It's like there's an enemy. Steve Jobs' enemy wasn't the BlackBerry. It was all smartphones. They all, they all, all these keys. They're ter- he put them all on the board. Oh, it's this bottom half. Let's just get rid of that bottom half. That's a perspective. I see that missing in almost, and that gives you goosebumps almost when you, mm-hmm. when you do it well. I see that missing in a lot of demos or conversations people have. I want to talk about that and why that's happening and what can be done about it. <laughs> because with what you, what Jobs and Friedman, Freed, 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 Jason Freed, Freed, and all these other guys done is they celebrated the root causes, right? They literally celebrated the root cause. So when he says to you, that, well, it's not free. It's 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 all your advertising. It's your privacy. Yeah. He's basically just told you that your the current state problem mm. is you lack privacy, and then he told you the root cause of that is because they scan your email and do, like so they, he just leaves with the root cause and he celebrates the root cause, right? Your boy Jobs did the same thing. He said this is taking up space. It's not allowing you to do this. It's not allowing you to do that. And so, therefore, the, it leads you to the problem. So you can go through the root cause, you can go through the problem, you can go through the impact, you can go any way, but you have to go one of those. And so that's why the pick is so important, and that's why I came up with the pick, is it, it forces organizations to understand the root cause, the problem, and the impact that they solve. And if they teach that to salespeople, it gives them somewhat of a, as, of a what you call it, a position, or, a, or a, what do you call it? A, Point of view. Point of view. But, but then, but then Keenan, you have to know how to tell it, right? So it's one thing to have it, the pick done, right? The one of the yeah. things I wish was in this book, and maybe it's being your follow-up. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to have the pick and to, and to know it. It's a completely other thing to be able to move people and tell the story. Yes. Like I yeah. walk into, I walked in, I did a guest lecturing in colleges a while back and these professors knew the domain like down, but they were boring. Mm-hmm. Like, and these slides, you can do this process that you have and, and bore people to tears. Yeah, fair enough. Like yep. Jason's a storyteller. You're yep. a storyteller, Keenan. Jobs yep. was certainly probably the best that's ever lived. Yep. It's just like, I wish there was a way to take this in the book and like, okay, now we're going to teach you how to, how to tell it because that's going to create the feeling. Mm-hmm. Like Jeff, you have a point of view in what you do. Yeah. I don't you're know if that's, I don't you know if that's also a present that point of view. You present that point of view. You can do it in slides with bullets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or you could do, I mean, we all, we can't be Steve Jobs, obviously, but we could do a version of that. Is yeah. there a framework that we could plug gap into to craft the narrative? I guess, Keenan, is, is where I'm pressing you a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great point. And being able to craft that narrative is a big deal. Jeff, you're mm-hmm. going to say something. I was just going to say, I'm not, I'm not sure that that is a skill set. Um, uh, I, I think that that might be a, a, an, er, an, an errant personality trait or ability that makes the difference between why some people will be successful in sales and why others will never be successful in sales. Um, And I think if you have that innate ability, I think that then you can hone that skill and be better at it. But I do think that there is a, a, a personality uh, uh, trait within certain individuals to be able to, take information up here and transition it into a story out here that is captivating. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, let me push back on you a little bit. I, I, I believe one of my philosophies that I live by is everybody I know that knows something about something, they learned it. Now, can I be as good as Michael Jordan or Jason Freed or Steve Jobs? No. Or Keen? No. But can I level up to a point of better than most? Be a one percenter. One percenter. Yeah. Is there is there like a basic? Can I can I get to be a competent? 
Yes. And I believe the answer to that is, is yes. And I believe there's a framework that if Keenan and I sat in a room for a day or four hours or even without me, he did it on his own. Like I guarantee if he put his mind to it, he'd be like, okay, here's how I'm going to now take this stuff and turn it into a narrative that's going to move people. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. and I think that's where my challenge has been is I'd like to practice this so that it, it becomes a part of who I am. I mean, I understand the framework and everything, but I don't feel comfortable about getting that narrative across in a way that will work. And I, uh, like you were saying, you know, some people have it, maybe some people don't, but on the other hand, we, we can work hard to try to get better at it. If we, yeah, really I, I mean, I do this on cold calls. Like that's the thing I teach. I, I think it's a huge opportunity in cold calling. Most people, when they cold call are boring. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, so I start to think to myself, what is if Steve Jobs cold called? What would he sound like? Mm -hmm. So I start thinking about that a little bit. And in, in the world, of, I, everything goes to me. I strip it back to triathlon. So it's what I like to do. And like, hey, Josh, I was just talking to this guy, Matt. He's training for an Ironman. His wife is so upset. He's sleeping at three o'clock in the afternoon, nothing left in the refrigerator. Kids never see him sleeping in on Sundays. And I was just curious, like, how are you balancing work, life, and family with training for an Ironman. Are you, are you in the doghouse too? Like that's a decent way to start a 15 second phone call with an Ironman athlete. Not, we help you optimize your Ironman experience. Like we're getting to the same thing, but the narrative is complete. The, the, as right. Kenan would call it maybe, or I don't know how, the presentation layer mm -hmm. in, in tech terms, right? Kevin is like, there's the yeah. code, which Kenan's talking about in his book, which is awesome. But what I'm talking about Kenan is now the presentation layer. Right, like, how do we tell it in a way that's like, hey, you know, you know, you're on this, you're on this website, your e-commerce company, you got people coming in there, they put something in a shopping cart, they're on their mobile device, they forget to put an email address in, they bail, and you have no way to retarget them. We call those ghosts. We help you identify them. Let me ask you a question: How are you identifying ghosts today? Mm -hmm. Like that makes you not the best story, but it's better than most. <laughs> Twenty-five percent. What, what makes what makes that story so good? is you're, you're using a story to get to the problem. Yes. Right, so, so what I like, so you, 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 I think you created a false narrative and didn't realize it. You use that story and then you said, that's better than our product does X, Y, Z. But that's not a, for the right comparison. What you would really compare that with is coming up with a story to ask those questions rather than saying, you know, can I get 30 seconds? Then you say, tell me how you deal with abandon, uh, card abandonment. Could you walk me through how you deal with customers who, you know, only buy one thing and don't upsell. So what you're doing is you're operating from an assumptive position, telling a story about the problems in hope they'll connect with the problem. And I can see, depending on who you're talking to, how that could might work a little better than actually just asking the direct question. But it just needs to be called out is, I don't teach anywhere, do, 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 do I, um, uh, in the book, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, encourage people to talk about the future state on a cold call. Like I say, don't touch the future state. You got 30 seconds if you can ask three questions to get them to talk about a particular problem they might be having that you can fix, now you're heading in the right direction. And I like your point of using a story to ask that question. Yeah, so the way, the way I do it, I, so I have a four part, we don't have to get into this on this call, but I have a four part yeah. cold calling framework. Problem, poke the bear, I call it. Problem, poke the bear. And so it starts off with, hey, you know, you, you know you're, you're on this website and people put some stuff in their shopping cart. Maybe they're on a mobile device. They get distracted and leave before they put their email address in. You have no way to market to them and get them back into the store. We call those ghosts. And I was just curious, how are you going about getting those ghosts back in the store today? We, we can't do that. What do you mean? And now we're kind of in a conversation. So the, the problem was first. Yeah. I kind of set it up on yeah. a cold call. If I kind of start in immediately with questions, it's I feel like you need a little setup. Yep. So four, four or five sentence problem. And then, then poke the bear. How, how you doing? Well, we're not. What do you mean? And now we're in a conversation, right? So that's the kind of idea. Now in this gap selling, it's kind of the same thing at a much deeper level when, when we're undoing the, the layers. But when we deck that and we actually now have to do the presentation, the demo, I would love to see a, a Steve Jobs version of it. Obviously, it's not going to be Steve, a, Keenan, a Keenan version of what that might look like. Here's the cool part about that, though, right? And maybe I'm missing something in this. If you've done the discovery correctly and you've done, you've actually found the gap. And I talk about this very specifically in the book. The story is your story now. So it comes down to Josh. You, I, I recall you saying that 
this these, you have these level of abandonments and, and you can't stand the ghost. Let me show you how we address that. And you said because of that ghost, you are spending X, X amount of money on, on additional marketing that you would really hope to use over here. So now that we show you, let me show you how we can take that additional marketing dollars and move it over here. So now the only person in the world that exists on a Keenan or a Gap selling demo is you. It's, right, but you said, okay, go. This is what I'm saying. This is, this is, I, so first off, I love that. But what I'm saying is, I would, this is what I'd love to do with you in a room for three hours. I would love to say, how can we make it more like Steve Jobs when he presents? And I know I keep saying Steve Jobs because we all know him. He's entertaining. Yep. He shows the graph the, the, in, the, in the first keynote of the iPhone. People are laughing. Like there's some jokes. This is what it looks like. He has the rotary phone. Yep. Like there's this, you feel something when you listen to Jobs speak. He makes the point. Yes. What you're talking about. But there's, a, there's this like narrative and storytelling and humor and entertainment aspect that is completely missing from cold calls from cold emails, from discovery calls, were riddled with bullets that kill in PowerPoint yep. presentations. Yep. And I love the data, I love all the stuff in here. I'm just saying, can we add a presentation layer to it if that we like, get, tells the story? Let's do that, let's do that for the discovery. I like where you did it, from the cold emails, the cold calls, and the discovery. I'm down with that, but not on the demo. And here's why, right? When you think about a job's doing a, a, dem a demo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He hasn't sat and talked to every single person in the audience. He doesn't know that you're interested in this for right. ABC and she's right. interested for X, Y, Z, right? So he has to do that. Right. He has to keep you, give you enough so you take what he gives you and you interpret it for yourself. But when you are on a one-to-one -one sales call, I better right. ask enough questions so that the story I'm telling is yours. I'm not going to use a rotary phone because I know you don't even have a rotary phone. <laughs> right? like, I'm going to I'm gonna zero in on the fact that your daughter lives in another country and, and she right. can't get hold of you fast enough and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to talk about how you were scared, but now you don't have to be scared anymore. I'm going to talk to you about how now you can see her face where you couldn't see her face before. I'm going to talk about how you're not going to miss your grandchild growing up. It is going to be so tailored to you, you're going to think I built the damn thing for you. Right, but Keenan, I would argue with you that one of the, one of the many reasons why you're successful, to, for me, for my chair, I don't, and I just know you're online. You're assuming I'm successful. Is, is, well, you know, in your own mind at least. Yeah, true. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, is that, is that you, you're, you're a good storyteller. Like your book is full of stories. I mean, the truck driver one that I just read about the person going to the, the presidential campaign and got stuck in the mud. But th that's a, that's, I remember that story more than some other chapters. Why? Because you told it a great story. The other one you had in the airport with your, with your Palm Pilot. You're a great storyteller. Maybe you've always been a great storyteller. I think there's a real opportunity for you to take this stuff and to, not for the demo, I agree, but for this other stuff, for the yeah. discovery and to wrap around some kind of narrative and the same thing with you, Jeff, with the roofing company. There's so much stuff I would imagine that you could do that's not so on the nose. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that. Yep. That's good stuff. I think you're right. How to do that? I don't know. Maybe we should get, we should, maybe we should get together and we should, man. A webinar or something. Something. Not a, I'm, sick of, I'm sick of webinars. Yeah. Just well, no, I mean, no, my point is we, we build the framework and then oh. we got to give it to people somehow. Right. 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 Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. I would show. love to, I'd love to riff on that, man. I'd All love right. to riff on that. I, I beg you guys to do that. I was thinking maybe this the book that you recommended uh, in your in your book, Keenan, might might be the answer. But I love what Josh is bringing out right now. So, yeah. All right. All right. Good. 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 So, all right, everybody, we're well past our time. This was fantastic, Kevin. I really appreciate your participation, Broderick. Love it, Thank baby, you. as always. Um, Braun, Keenan, my man, baby. I don't even know what to say. We have a good time every time. We my man, this, right? Did you win your um? Did you win your little I, lead IQ bracket? <laughs> Dude, I, I, I funny story. I had them take me out of that because it's so anti. I, I don't believe in brackets and competing, so I had them I, I, opt me out of it. Oh, I didn't know. You know what? See, I, I shouldn't have. You know what? I did something I not normally do. I was telling them earlier. I just assumed that I, I, I had to participate, not participate, but I just assumed there was nothing I could do. So I didn't really promote it very much. I don't I like it. I don't like the premise. I don't like the premise of it because I don't believe I don't believe in the premise. I think everybody's got some stuff and there's different. I just don't like. I just it made me feel weird. I just didn't like it. Yeah. No, it's funny. It made me feel weird as well. Like last yeah. year, um, who did it? Last year, someone did one. It'll come to me in a second. And it was my book. It was the best book. 
I had no qualms promote like pushing that, getting behind that because it's a book. So yes. I, you know, I had to compete with different books. Yes, I yes. Made it about a person. Yes. I felt very yes. uncomfortable yes. saying, hey, yes. go vote for me because I'm a better sales guy or whatever. Right. It was and weird. Bad. I just did not feel comfortable with it that was, at all. It was so weird. I ended up losing and I was okay with it. But I didn't even think about saying, take me out. Didn't even know that was an option. I saw another I poll today. I saw another poll today. Someone did like, when you think of JB, do you think of John Burroughs? Yeah, Jordan I saw Belfort, that. Josh oh, yeah, Brown, I saw I'm like, yep. I'm like yep. is this what was going on? Hey, I, I voted for you, Josh. If it's I, I worth hate, anything, I, I did vote you. I don't know, dude. I don't, <laughs> social media sometimes. I don't know. These polls are ridiculous on LinkedIn at this point, too. Every, everybody's doing a poll for something. I thought right of Justin now. Bieber. Crazy. That's who I think. Oh, there, you there you go. There you go. Keenan, thanks, man. Thank yeah. you, guys, everybody. All right, and a quick announcement. Listen, everybody, if you're still here, you get to this. I should have done the beginning, but that's okay. I am giving away... 90 days, three months wow. of one-on-one -on -one gap selling training, private gap selling coaching and training, not even training, coaching, one-on-one wow. -on -one with me for 90 days in celebration wow. of the 50K thing here. So um, I'll put, I guess, a comment here. If you want a chance to win that and basically sit with me every week and help you get better at gap selling, you want to jump on that. I'm and then if you need sales therapy after you do that, you can call me and I'll kind of talk you guys down. And <laughs> <laughs> make you feel good, good, good. All right, I'll put the link in here. Guys, thank you very, very much. You guys were the best. Um, and you guys know what hey, I'm Keenan, saying. Hey, real quick before we go, what, what's, what does it feel like to get to 50K on a book, man? I mean, you probably, did you in your wildest dreams ever think no. that? No, I had a goal of 10,000. I figured I could sell about 10,000. And then I figured out I'd just give them away to, to get clients interested. I had no clue that, well, I never thought we'd get to 50,000. How does and that so feel, man? Oh, oh my God. So if I'm being completely honest, yeah. maybe I need to see a therapist about this. Um, it feels good. Like there's two feelings, right? In the, in the, the better feeling and the more, um, the feeling I should be leaning into more is it feels good to know that, that I've accomplished something that people find value in that's helping people. I get notices all the time. Like sometimes it kind of emotional. Like, I was, I was about to lose my job and I read this and now I'm the top wow. guy and I took my family wow. on vacation or wow. I use it to get a job and cause I couldn't get a job and I use it and I blew them away with gaps. Selling. So that makes you feel really good. Um, but the, the, the overarching one, and I don't know if it's narcissism or maybe it's my own childhood. Maybe I was beat as a child and I don't remember. But it's sort of like the um, um, football uh, Aaron Rodgers feeling. Every publisher told me to fuck off. Is that right? Yeah, oh yeah, no one would publish it for me. Every why? Because there was so many. Why? Because there's so many sales books, or sales books don't do very well. It's got to be really unique. You know, you you got to commit to getting us to ten thousand. Your your social following is coming up, but it's not quite where it needs to be. Everybody had every excuse in the book, and I was, you know, so right now. I'm sort of a little emotional, like, fuck you. Like you get paid, like you get paid and this is what you get paid to do because I know some of the other books that were published around mine haven't touched what I've done. So sometimes I got- so that, fuel, that fueled you in a sense. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It always fuels me. It was funny. My, um, well, you just reached out to me the other day, 27 years ago is I got my second real job. It's really my career started. I mean, I was bartender party or whatever. My real job is an IT consulting salesperson in 97, right before Y2K. And he, he just sent me something the other day. It's so funny. He goes, do you remember 27 years ago? That's when I started. But he said to me something. He goes, when I was younger, he goes, you're the easiest guy to manage. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, all I have to do is say to you, you can't do something. <laughs> wow. He goes, if I just tell you I don't think you can do something, it gets done. He goes, you're the easiest guy in the world to manage. So, yeah, when people tell me I can't do something or show they don't believe in me, something, something is triggered. And I go, oh. No. Keenan, how many copies of Not Taught did you sell? I don't know, maybe. I, didn't, I don't have a clue. Maybe 3,000, maybe. 2, not even, so nothing even close to what Gap no. Selling is. Not even close. Not even on the planet. Nope. That's, a great, that's a great book, too. But, uh, but yeah, maybe the next one where you can talk about a little more business development side of things that you and Josh are going to collaborate on and come up with. Man, set 100K on that one. I mean, I would take 50K. Mid Dexy's Midnight Runners only needed to come on Eileen, man. That's more than most people get. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, all right, guys. All right, guys. See Thank you. you. I recommend your book to everybody and who, the, those that buy it and read it, they thank me for that. So um, you awesome. get it's a great thank book. You, Everyone's liking it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks again, Keenan. Thank right, you. Peace. I'm out, guys.